You know, if this were China, you'd all say, good evening, at the same time. They've got your beat. Let's try it. Good evening. Good evening. Ni hao ba. Wow. I'm impressed. So this is not a campaign rally because this is a publicly supported event. So I can't be, it can't be a campaigner for some proposition. So I've decided to shift the first part of the talk to campaign for Monsanto. Monsanto has been voted the most hated company on earth for 11 years in a row. And that's got, they've got stiff competition. <laughs> Halliburton, BP during the, well, you know, a lot of the Wall Street companies were big time, but I checked, I just Googled the question of Monsanto the most evil. And according to Forbes, Monsanto is so despised by environmentalists that Google's first suggested search term for the St. Louis company Monsanto is Monsanto evil. I think we should campaign for them to win again this year. And I want to give you some of the background of why my candidate should be voted most evil, or most hated, or most disliked, or most distrusted. I think they have won them all. How many people are familiar with Monsanto? Raise your hand. I have to ask you some more questions. How many people here are students? All right, how many people are professors or faculty? <laughs> tell, them, you tell them what their homework is. How many are staff here? How many are plants by Monsanto? <laughs> Monsanto told us that PCBs were safe. It was an industrial chemical. And they manufactured it in Anniston, Alabama. And a friend of mine was a doctor there. And he said these people were horribly sick. The people that worked at the Monsanto factory. And he didn't know what they were creating. I told him last year that it was PCB. Now the executives at Monsanto knew that they were poisoning the people in Addison, Alabama. They knew from documents made public from a lawsuit that they were poisoning people all over the earth with their PCBs. In fact, a consultant to Monsanto had the audacity to take a live fish and put it in the river in Addison, Alabama. Within one minute, the fish had no skin. It floated to the top and was spurting blood. But the Monsanto letter, characterizing their response to this and all such data, said, we can't afford to lose one dollar of business. They were fined $700 million for poisoning the people of Addison, Alabama. How many people are familiar with Agent Orange in Vietnam? Agent Orange was used as a defoliant, and several companies produced it, but Monsanto's was the most toxic. But when they wanted to demonstrate that dioxin wasn't dangerous, according to several sources, they took people who were exposed, who got cancer or some type of disease or skin problems, and put them into the unexposed category, and eliminated the statistical significance. And according to Kane Jenkins of the EPA, they submitted the wrong samples to the EPA and had consistently defrauded the government. And based on that, the victims of Agent Orange, the servicemen that went to Vietnam, were deprived of compensation. And so too were their families, many of whom had birth defects. And so too were the Vietnamese people. So I am campaigning hard for Monsanto. Monsanto told us that DDT was safe. And when it was banned in the United States, they sold it elsewhere. They told us that bovine growth hormone was safe. How many people have heard of bovine growth hormone? All right. Let me see if this one works. Help me. 
Is there an AV person in the house? Oh, thank you. All right. Bovine growth hormone injected into, un, into cows to increase milk supply. A former Monsanto scientist told me that some of his colleagues were testing the milk from treated cows. And they found so much of a cancer-promoting hormone, IGF-1, in the milk that the three Monsanto scientists refused to drink milk thereafter unless it was organic. One bought his own cow. He also told me, well actually I'll tell you the rest later when we get into GMOs, there's more about bovine growth hormone I want to share. Two Fox TV reporters in Tampa were going to blow the whistle on bovine growth hormone and link it to cancer. And then a, a letter arrived at Fox headquarters three days before the four-part news series was to be announced and, and aired. And it alleged that the reporters had lied and that the information was unsupported. And so <clears throat> the head of the station, who was an investigative reporter himself, walked the reporters through the script to make sure everything was backed up. And it was. Everything had been documented. So he reported that to the Fox Central. Fox then rescheduled it a week later. But next, Monsanto sent a letter their attorney sent a letter promising dire consequences to Rupert Murdoch and Fox if they aired the four-part news series. So one of the Fox TV reporters said that he was offered hush money, that he and his colleague were offered money, like two hundred and something thousand dollars, to leave the station and never talk about bovine growth hormone again. They refused. So they were led in a series of rewrites by the attorney for Fox TV, 81 rewrites, each one being more and more generous to Monsanto until finally the first opportunity in the reporter's contract gave Fox an excuse to fire them. So the reporters sued and said they were fired because they were going, they were using the Florida whistleblower laws because Fox was going to lie on television, which was illegal. And they were going to blow the whistle and that's why they were fired. So Jane Acree was awarded $425,000 from a jury who agreed. Fox appealed and won. Because according to the, Flo the Florida whistleblower laws, it only protects those who are going to blow the whistle on violating the law. And lying on television turns out not to be illegal. When the Canadian scientists in Health Canada were told by their superiors to approve bovine growth hormone with no evaluation, Dr. Shiv Chopra said, no way. We can't do it. He said, the, the, the director said, it was approved in the, by the FDA. He said, well, we should evaluate their approval. So he led a team, evaluated the approval of the FDA, and found it was a complete facade. The FDA, for example, did not require any tests on human toxicity from eating or drinking dairy products from treated cows. They just focused on the veterinary problems. And it turns out, when they looked at it, they ordered so few tests that the only veterinarian in the FDA who had dairy experience said, this is crazy, and started ordering more tests, he was fired. He sued, and at the trial, the FDA boss, his boss, admitted that it was a setup to kick him out. I interviewed him, Richard Burroughs. The FDA claimed that bovine growth hormone in the milk was destroyed not during pasteurization, 90% of it. But they were quoting research that had pasteurized the milk 120 times longer than normal. But it only destroyed 19%, not 90. To get the 90, they added powdered hormone to the milk at 147 times the natural occurring level, 
pasteurized it 120 times longer, and then destroyed 90% of the hormone. People at the FDA were so upset at the fast tracking of bovine growth hormone, someone stole the files, copied them, and tried to get the New York Times and others to broadcast them, and no one would touch it. So they sent it to Dr. Sam Epstein, and he got it out. And when he evaluated it with an expert in dairy, it turns out that when Monsanto scientists wanted to prove that injections did not interfere with the fertility of cows, they added cows to the study that were pregnant before injection. There was a study that came out in 2006, Journal of Reproductive Medicine, comparing the fraternal twins in the United States to the UK. We have a lot more fraternal twins here, and the rate is much higher, and they said it was because of the bovine growth hormone, because that promotes fraternal twins. Soon after bovine growth hormone was approved, milk duct tissue cancer went up just the same arc as the increase in bovine growth hormone by 60%. I am rooting for Monsanto to get this award. Now, bovine growth hormone was the first of the genetically engineered food-related products. Then they introduced genetically modified crops. They had patented glyphosate, which is a, originally patented in 1964 as a broad-spectrum chelator. So it binds with trace minerals, lots of them. And they found it was a fantastic herbicide and it killed lots of different plants. And the way that it kills plants is it deprives them of the important nutrients that they can use to defend themselves. It disables their metabolism. They don't have a lot of manganese, or magnesium, iron, etc. And then the glyphosate and the Roundup herbicide, which it was formulated into, promotes the pathogens in the soil, which then kill the plant. It also destroys beneficial bacteria in the soil. So it creates a perfect storm of weak and sick, defenseless plants and strong pathogens from the soil. And they patented it, and it became the world's best-selling herbicide. But their patent was going to run out in 2000. Fortunately for them, some scientists found bacteria growing in a chemical waste dump near their factory, in the presence of Roundup. Now, Roundup is a very strong antibiotic. It kills a lot of bacteria, far stronger than most of the antibiotics on the market used as medicine. It's patented to kill the beneficial gut bacteria in our gut. We'll get to that later. And they figured the bacteria survived in the presence of Roundup. Let's put it in the food supply. So they took the gene that allowed the bacteria to survive, put it into soybeans, and now they created Roundup Ready soybeans. And they told everyone, the use of Roundup will go down because of these Roundup Ready soybeans. In the meantime, they built other factories because they knew it wasn't true. And the use of these herbicide-tolerant crops, where you buy Monsanto seed, you sign a contract to buy their herbicide, increased the use of herbicide in the United States by more than half a billion pounds in the first 16 years. Now, Roundup turns out to be so used, it's found in the air, in the rain, in the groundwater, in the surface water, in our urine, blood, and the blood of unborn fetuses. Drinking water. Drinking water. In fact, two weeks ago, a study came out, and they fed rats drinking water spiked with Roundup at levels well below the legal limit. And the rats died two or three times more than controls. They had pituitary kidney and liver damage and massive tumors, as much as 25% of their body weight. And the rats that were fed the Roundup Ready corn also 
had these problems, whether or not the corn had been treated with Roundup. So both the corn and the Roundup cause as much as 80% tumors in the female rats, 50% in the male rats, about 20% in the controls, over a two-year period. Most, nearly all of the tumors in the females were in the mammary glands. Roundup has been linked with cancer before. It's linked with Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, endocrine disruption, massive endocrine disruption, which can affect reproductive health. In lab animals fed Roundup ready soybeans and corn, the rodents suffered from, well, female rats fed genetically modified soy. More than half of their babies died within three weeks. The babies were smaller and couldn't reproduce. Hamsters by the third generation, most lost the ability to have babies. They died at four or five times the rate. Some had hair growing in their mouths. Mice had smaller babies and fewer babies. Changes in the uterus, in the ovaries, in the testicles, in the young sperm cells. In rats, the testicles changed from pink to blue. I usually use this time to get some water so it can sink in. And I often show a picture of it. Even the way the DNA functioned in the embryo offspring was different when the parents of the mice ate genetically engineered soy compared to non-GM soy. But Monsanto had said that Roundup was so safe you can drink it. And they said it was biodegradable, but a New York court convicted them of false advertising. They continued to sell it as biodegradable in Europe until the French Supreme Court convicted and fined them. It can last months or years in the soil. The longest recorded half-life of round of glyphosate is 22 years. So it turns out when you spray it on the ground, it can destroy the availability of nutrients for future generations of planting. And it can promote pathogens in the soil, which can then hurt other plants in future generations. And it's been responsible for promoting more than 40 plant diseases in the United States, many of which had been well controlled before Roundup was introduced. Now, I want to talk about Monsanto's political influence for a moment. We're going to lighten up soon, by the way. This is the heavy part. If you leave in the middle, you're going to be really depressed. The person in charge of FDA policy for bovine growth hormone and for GMOs, Michael Taylor. How many people have heard of Michael Taylor? He's our U.S. food safety czar. But in 1992, he was the deputy commissioner for policy, the number two person at the FDA. He had been recruited specifically by the FDA for a position created for him to be in charge of policy while GMO policy and bovine growth hormone policy was being evaluated. Michael Taylor was Monsanto's former attorney and later Monsanto's vice president and chief lobbyist, and then the U.S. food safety czar. Guess what he did when he was part of the FDA as policy chief? Any guesses? Right. Substantial equivalence. Substantial equivalence was sort of the term bandied about. Sounds scientific, doesn't it? GMOs are substantially equivalent to non-GMOs. This was the title of one of their, one of their uh, research studies. In fact, the only research study they published in the early days on, ge on genetically engineered soybeans. GM soybeans are substantially equivalent to their conventional counterparts. It was said in the title, it was said in the abstract, it was said in the conclusion. The data showed differences. They also rigged their research to avoid finding problems. It was considered junk science. Not only that, but they left information out that was later recovered. Like, for example, in cooked GM soy, there's as much as seven times the amount of a known allergen called trypsin inhibitor. They left that out. They left the out, out the fact there was a, a doubling of an anti-nutrient, a soy lectin, that can block the absorption of nutrients. They left that out. But the concept of substantial equivalence was the excuse it was actually spelled out in the policy. 
The agency is not aware of any information showing that the foods derived by these new methods differ from other foods in any meaningful or uniform way. In other words, we looked around. We couldn't see any difference. Therefore, it's the same. Or substantially equivalent. No testing, therefore, is necessary. Monsanto, who told us that PCBs, Agent Orange, and DDT were safe, can tell us if GMOs are safe. In fact, they don't have to tell us. They don't have to label it. They don't have to talk to the FDA. They can put it on the market without telling anyone. And so can you. So that's why GMOs are on our plates. Because the concept that the agency was not aware of any information showing that GMOs were different. But thousands of documents made public from a lawsuit made that into a lie also. The overwhelming consensus among the FDA scientists were that GMOs were dangerous and different and could lead to allergies, toxins, new diseases, and nutritional problems. They urged their superiors over and over again to require a long-term study. Now, years later, the scientists at the FDA have been vindicated. The American Academy of Environmental Medicine, in 2009, after reviewing the animal feeding studies, say there are so many problems, health damage in the rats and mice that were fed genetically modified soy and corn, that every doctor in America should prescribe non-GMO diets. They said these animals are suffering from reproductive disorders, immune system problems, gastrointestinal problems, accelerated aging, organ damage, dysfunction or regulation of cholesterol and insulin. I interviewed doctors at the Academy, American Academy of Environmental Medicine after this policy was created. Many of these doctors have been prescribing non-GMO diets to their patients for years. Now, up until this point, I had been interviewing and representing scientists. Do you know how scientists speak? They say, converging lines of evidence suggest that it may be raining. Or, it, I, it appears that I am cold. You know, they don't actually make conclusions. They're very careful not to state anything that might be controversial. These doctors, however, were saying, GMOs cause inflammation. My allergic patients react more to GMOs. GMOs are linked to brain fog, to uh, anxiety, to asthma, to allergies, to gastrointestinal distress. When I get my patients off GMOs, they all get better. So we interviewed patients, we interviewed, we had unsolicited emails, we started collecting information for people that switched from GM to non-GM, and the results were amazing. We talked to someone 25 days into the, into the non-GMO diet, three days her Crohn's disease of 30 years disappeared. She had lost 10 pounds and her skin condition was getting better. Someone else, irritable bowel, got in two weeks. Another one, got in four weeks. Nine-year-old, severe gut pain, disappeared. Twelve-year-old, no more asthma inhaler, no more migraines. Five years infertility, three weeks on a non-GMO diet, pregnant. That was an interesting reaction. I agree. <laughs> Can we try that again? Five years? Never mind. We were seeing unbelievable responses so quickly. But the interesting thing was this. When you ask them, how are you avoiding GMOs? They're not labeled. You can't just go and say, okay, I'll take the ones that are not labeled GMO. Because in 49 other countries have that, but not here. How do they avoid GMOs? They have to create a strategy, mostly by organic, by products that say non-GMO, by products listed in our non-GMO shopping guide at non-gmoshoppingguide.com, or avoid the at-risk ingredients. So when they told me they started to buy organic, I thought, well, that's a cofactor. Maybe the organic prop is so much better than the non-organic. Non-GMO is just one of the benefits. And some of them were avoiding processed foods, and I thought, oh, that's just too much. Some had been taken off of gluten and dairy from their doctors, and I just threw my hands up and said, too many possible causes. Until I interviewed the farmers and the veterinarians who had taken their livestock off of GM corn and soy. Two days on non-GM soy, 650 sows and their piglets, 
the diarrhea, massive problems that would have been fatal, disappeared. Conception rate increased. Litter size increased. Use of antibiotics decreased. Birth defects disappeared. Death from ulcers and bloat disappeared. All he did was switch from GM soy to non-GM soy. There were no gluten-free pigs. And for the cows, there's no dairy-free cows. But a cattle lot operator said he didn't realize it until he took GM corn out that the more he'd been feeding the GM corn, the more deaths he'd have. And pneumonia and other infectious diseases. He took out the GM corn, death rate went down, infection rate went down. Over and over again, we heard the stories. And if you look at what the animals were getting better from, they were the same categories that the humans were getting better from. And the same categories that the American Academy of Environmental Medicine described as those suffered by animals in labs fed GMOs. And not coincidentally, it's the same categories of diseases and disorders that are on the rise in the U.S. population. Inflammatory bowel disease, up 42% since GMOs. Multiple chronic illnesses nearly doubled in the first nine years. Food allergies doubled. Infertility skyrocketing. Cancers up. How can GMOs be causing these things? We talked about one problem, Roundup. Depriving nutrients, causing reproductive disorders, possibly linked to cancer. There's also a new pathogen that's linked to spontaneous abortions and infertility. This new pathogen is found in the aborted fetal tissue of animals where there's high amounts of infertility and it's in the feed sprayed with Roundup. You also have the BT toxin. This is the corn and cotton plants that are engineered to produce a toxic insecticide that breaks open the stomach of insects to kill them. The Monsanto said, don't worry about putting BT in corn and cotton. It only pokes little holes in the cell walls of insects, not humans, and besides, it's destroyed during digestion. Well, it was destroyed during digestion, apparently until last year when they finally studied the blood of pregnant women and unborn fetuses, and they found it in 93% of the pregnant women and 80% of their unborn fetuses. Monsanto's BT toxin from their corn. And it doesn't poke holes in human cells until they published a study this year showing it pokes holes in human cells, causing leakage. So if we're causing leakage in human cells, that could be linked to inflammatory bowel as well, gastrointestinal distress. It's also a potential allergen, a very strong potential allergen. It could help increase the immune system responses. By poking holes in the human cell lining in the, in the gut, it can cause leaky gut. That can cause undigested food particles to go into the blood, which can cause an antibody response, which can lead to food allergies and autoimmune disease and inflammation and possibly cancer and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and a whole host of other diseases. So this explains why GMOs may be responsible for these same categories in lab animals, in livestock, in humans, and in U.S. population figures. So around now, I'd like you to consider casting your vote for Monsanto. But let me tell you what their plans are. In 1999, January, San Francisco, their consultant, Arthur Anderson, which was also Enron's consultant, described how they had worked with the executives. They asked the executives of Monsanto, describe your ideal future in 15 to 20 years. And they described a world in which 100% of all commercial seeds were genetically engineered and patented. And Arthur Anderson worked backwards from that goal to create the strategy and tactics to achieve it. They were planning to replace nature. Take the billions of years of evolution that created nature as we have it and replace it with designer genes, designer organisms, designed for profit and control and for selling Monsanto's chemicals. They went on a shopping spree. They bought seed companies all over the world and became from a chemical company to a life sciences company and the largest seed owner in the world. In India, they bought Mihiko, which sells cotton seeds. 
and then eliminated the availability of non-GM cotton seeds in many states, and did a high-pressure, high-deceptive program to convince millions of farmers to borrow money to pay for the more expensive GM seeds and associated chemicals. And these crops are not reliable. And many of these farmers who bought from loan sharks with rates as high as 7% per month on loans were unable to pay back the loans. And the number of farmer suicides linked to Monsanto's BT cotton over the last 10 years is about 200,000. Thousands of farm workers picking the BT cotton are getting rashes and itching all over their bodies. Thousands of animals grazing on the cotton plants after harvest have died or gotten sick. I went to one village, they allowed their buffalo to graze on natural cotton plants for eight years, there was no problem. But after one day grazing on Monsanto's BT cotton plants, all 13 buffalo died within three or four days. So this was part of Monsanto's plan to replace nature. It was backfiring in developing countries, but that didn't matter. They kept distorting and denying the evidence. At the same San Francisco conference, a biotech company projected a 95% takeover of all commercial seeds in the world within five years. So they were wanting to fast-track the seeds. But it's not just seeds. They've released genetically modified insects in the Cayman Islands. They have desires for genetically engineered salmon and for cows and pigs. Basically, trees, flowers, everything. But something happened. Three weeks after the San Francisco conference, the gag order was lifted on a scientist who had been working to figure out how to test for the safety of GMOs. Dr. Arpad Pustai, one of the world's leading scientists, certainly the world's, the world's leading scientist in his field, had been given three million bucks by the UK government to figure out how to test for GMO safety. His protocols were supposed to be used as the approval protocols in the EU until he discovered that GMOs were very dangerous. They had caused massive damage to rats in just 10 days. He went public with his concerns, was a hero at his prestigious institute for two days. Then the phone calls came. UK Prime Minister's office to the director. The next day, Pustai was fired after 35 years. Silenced with threats of a lawsuit, they never implemented his protocols. They embarked on a campaign to destroy his reputation. And this pattern of trying to destroy the reputation of scientists who discover problems has continued and eliminated all but a few bold scientists to do research in this area. But his gag order was lifted by an order of parliament. He got his data back. And what is most interesting, besides the fact that this information is now published, is that a firestorm of coverage happened in the UK and around Europe. More than 700 articles within a month. Within 10 weeks, the tipping point of consumer rejection forced the hands of the food companies. Unilever, Nestle's, McDonald's, Burger King, Walmart, Sainsbury, Marks and Spencer, everyone kicked GMOs out of Europe. Out of Europe not the United States. So Hershey's sells non-GMO kisses in France. But our kisses are genetically engineered. Why can't we get the kisses they enjoy in France? <laughs> Nestle sells non-GMO chocolate. Unilever. Our Briars low-fat ice cream. They took genes from a fish, put it in yeast that grows fish proteins that are put in the low-fat ice cream for briars. And the dairy is from cows treated with bovine growth hormone. 
and fed genetically engineered crops. But this turning point, this tipping point in Europe, is very significant. This happened in 1999. But we saw another tipping point less than a decade later with bovine growth hormone, which is banned in Europe, banned in Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and now Walmart's milk, Starbucks milk, Yoplait, Dan, and most American dairies. Because consumers learned about the cancer risk and a tipping point was achieved. How many Americans would it take avoiding GMOs for the Kraft food manager who's aware that they don't sell GMOs in their products in Europe or Japan? They're aware that GMO and anti-GMO sentiment can ignite and travel very quickly. How many points drop in market share are they willing to withstand before they decide to take GMOs out? There's no consumer benefits. There's no consumer benefit. No one wakes up in the morning wanting their daily dose of Roundup or BT. They're not going to say low GMOs, like low fat. I think any percentage drop in market share that they can show as a result of anti-GMO sentiment is sufficient to be a food industry sell signal. And I think about 5% of consumers would be enough to do that. 5% is 15 million. There's 28 million that buy organic on a regular basis. Many more million of parents of young children who would do it for their kids. Many more who are sick and may feel better on a non-GMO diet. Many more who are religious. And religions, many of them think GMO really means God move over. <laughs> and have actually said, the World Council of Churches, I think there's 300 churches part of that. They said churches should work with NGOs to stop GMOs in agriculture. Stop the genetic engineering of agriculture. They're for labeling. You can't plant GMOs on the Anglican church property in, in England. There's enough resistance that we can stop GMOs with a tipping point. So it's not a vote. We don't need to ask Obama for a bailout. Labeling will accelerate that because 53% of Americans say they would avoid GMOs if labeled. What are the companies going to do if they have to put a label on? Someone from the industry said a GMO label is like a skull and crossbones. Are they going to label it? I think a lot of the smarter companies are going to eliminate GMOs rather than admit that, we're, that they're using them. And what, who is trying to stop Prop 37? Coke? Pepsi, Campbell's, Kraft, Kellogg's, they don't want you to know that they're using GMOs. They don't want to deal with it. So actually, California is an incredibly leveraged state right now. If labeling passes, it may accelerate the tipping point forcing the companies to say, okay, I've got to fess up or eliminate GMOs. And if they eliminate GMOs in California, these national brands have to eliminate GMOs all over. Because once they put it out there and it gets distributed through the distribution, if it's not labeled in New Jersey or Texas or whatnot, it may end up being sold in California. So they're going to remove it or label it. I think it'll be national. So they are pouring on the money. $35 million in disinformation. They are confusing voters by saying that labeling is confusing. They're spending more money than they'll ever spend on labeling, telling you that labeling is too expensive. And then they have the audacity to publish ads that say, oh, we don't like this, not because it's labeling, but because it's not labeling enough. It labels my dog food, but not my steak. So we need to get a bigger labeling law. 
These guys have bad science down to a science. You know when they're lying, when their lips are moving. These guys are incredible. The audacity of these companies to say, you know something, trust us. You don't really need to know that you have GMOs in your food, do you? I mean, look at us. Are we going to hurt you? This is Monsanto speaking, remember? They actually want us not to know anything about GMOs. Then on September 19th, this study comes out in France with the tumors and the deaths and the organ damage. This study is not insignificant. Within days, Russia banned the importation of genetically modified corn. Yes. Russia banned it because they realized, oh, this stuff will hurt our citizens. Why is this one significant? Not only the massive damage to the rats, but the biotech industry rigs their research to avoid finding problems. We've caught them red-handed using the wrong statistics, the wrong detection methods, the wrong animals, short feeding studies, 90-day feeding studies. They feed a rat 33% or 11% corn for 90 days and say, it's okay now for the Africans who eat 70% of their caloric intake to have our corn for the rest of their lives. In this study, they did two years. The first comprehensive two-year study. And what happened after 30, 90 days? Nothing. It was the fourth month that they started getting tumors. Conveniently just after the industry studies stopped. And by the end of two years, they had to kill a lot of the rats because the tumors were so big. It was interfering with their ability to breathe and function. The pictures are just horrific. And what is the biotech industry saying? They get together and say, we've got to come up with a strategy to discredit. And so they said, now, let's challenge the rats. They used Sprague Dolly rats. Sprague Dolly rats are prone to cancer, prone to tumors. So let's say, you can't trust this study because they use spray Dolly rats. That's the reason, spray Dolly rats. Well, how did the Monsanto's corn get on the market? and their Roundup on the market in Europe, they did studies with Sprague Dolly rats. They said, oh, it was the size of the control group. 10 females, 10 males, not enough. How did Monsanto's corn get on the market in Europe? They used 10 in the control group. But that didn't stop them. If you read the papers now, all over the country, they're saying, Sprague Dolly rats. Control group wasn't big enough. Protocols were wrong. Statistics were wrong. It's complete lie. It is ridiculously complete lie. It is, it is so obviously a bold-faced lie. It was a, it's a desperate attempt to protect their multi-billion dollar industry, which this one study should flush it down the toilet. This one study is sufficient proof to eliminate GMOs, and they are freaking out. But we don't have to wait until the Obama administration says, okay, this study is real, or GMOs should be studied more we don't have to wait. We can stop eating GMOs now. And it's easier if they're labeled. And if enough people do it, we will get rid of GMOs. So the couch potato junk food eating American who hasn't yet figured out that food relates to health, they'll never know they're eating GMOs. They'll never know we got rid of it for them. In this group, I love speaking to schools. I love speaking to students. I get to think about the future. In this case, we have two futures to choose from. A genetically modified, or the results of the billions of years of evolution. 
It's not just the BT toxin and the Roundup which cause problems. It's the process of genetic engineering. You take a gene from soil bacteria that produces a BT toxin, make millions of copies, put it into a gene gun, shoot that gun into a plate of millions of plant cells, clone those cells into a plant. Now every single cell of the plant has a gene-sized spray bottle that produces the BT toxin. But something else has happened. The process of insertion plus cloning causes massive collateral damage in the DNA. Hundreds or thousands of mutations up and down the DNA can be created. Up to 5% of the naturally functioning genes in the plant can change their levels of expression. In Monsanto's BT corn, 43 genes dramatically increased or decreased the number of proteins they're producing. In one case, a silent gene was switched on, producing a new allergen that's never found in corn, but is found in Monsanto's corn. In their soy, as we said, a new, an existing soy allergen is up sevenfold. That's not supposed to happen. It's not part of the design. It's part of the collateral damage. And when they said they were going to be genetically engineering food, so many scientists around the world figured they must have come up with a new technique because the techniques we're using are prone to side effects. And then they realized, they haven't. They're using the same shotgun method or agriculture or bacterial infection and cloning that is so imprecise. But the biotech industry has a rule book. You take the criticisms that they're going to lodge against you and then you go to the extreme. So it's an imprecise method, so what do they say? It's more precise. It's a dangerous method, so that they say it's healthier. It's very damaging to the environment. We know this. They say it's good for the environment. They go to the opposite extreme, saying it's safer than traditional food to create confusion. And then they spend literally hundreds of millions of dollars to prop up the myths. GMOs can't feed the world. They work against feeding the world. They actually lower yield. They increase the use of agricultural chemicals, concentrate the ownership of the food supply, eliminate the biodiversity in fields, and according to the experts at feeding the world, no current genetically engineered crop works in that favor. So we have a situation now where a few corporations with support of the US government are trying to design a new nature, replace nature. And that's on the one side. And life as we know it, or before 1996 when so many GMOs were introduced, is on the other side. Labeling is part of the balance because it gives people power. It gives the power to the people to make choices, and that could shift the balance of power in the market. So this is a very important time. And I'd like to encourage you to think about the impact of GMOs from this point. Because if we replace nature, it affects all who eat, all living beings, all future generations. I think that's crazy, insane. And I think that by taking steps to prevent that, we're doing more good than our ancestors have ever had the opportunity to do. Because they could never have done actions that could help protect all living beings and all future generations. Because there had never been a technology on Earth to create such a disruption. So I would like to encourage you all to learn more about GMOs, to get involved in educating others, and to think how you want to cast your vote. And I also want to suggest, finally, that we can all cast our vote for Monsanto as the most innovatively hated company <laughs> on the earth. Thank you very much. I want to introduce Patricia Bragg. Just because I love her, 
and I get to do it because I have the microphone. <laughs> Patricia Bragg is, is a leader in health in the United States. Her, her dad, Paul, Paul Bragg, started the first health food store, started the fitness movement. Patricia Bragg is a leader. She's a giant. And let's give her a warm welcome. By the way, by the way our product, Bragg Liquid Meters, is certified, certified non-GMO. And so it's very important. And I want you to know I'm very proud to be here tonight. And I think he should have filled up the stadium. That's what we should have had for him. Because this message is so strong, we have to stop GMOs, and we demand that it be labeled. And otherwise, we're not going to buy the products. Right? That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia Gray. And uh, before we go into a Q&A with Jeffrey, I just wanted to say a reason why we're here today. Um, we were sponsored by the Ivy Food Co-op during spring quarter. We were doing um, final survivals, passing out nutritious snacks for students. And one day when I was on campus, I was wearing a shirt that says, OMG, w OMG WTF, like what are we eating? And, oh, actually I said that wrong, apologize. GM and yeah, GMO, OMG, WTF, what are we eating? And so many students were asking me, GMO, like, what is your shirt mean? Like, what is, like, what is that? And this is a university. This is UC Santa Barbara. We founded environmental studies, like, and that's becoming one of the most popular majors out there. And to have this school start it and have, I mean, I probably got asked uh, over 100 times that day, what is a GMO? So my challenge as a student, I want to bring awareness to this campus. And my challenge to you students that are out there, it takes simple. It's really, really simple to educate your friends. This summer I was in Sacramento. A lot of people thought I was a little crazy when I was trying to explain to them the whole food co-op system and what GMO is. But seriously, it's, it's so easy to explain to people just the differences, just the simple differences. And if, you, if you're able just to go out and at least one time a day, at least try to outreach to someone or try to educate one of your friends, just imagine they can go out to somebody else and we can start spreading the word about this. And it's like what Jeffrey addressed, this is the tipping point. Our generation has a chance to fight against Monsanto and against the corporate takeover that they've been having. And if you really learn the details, it's... It, I don't, it shocks me. It, sometimes I'm just speechless to see what these corporations have been able to get away with. And it's a simple way of thinking about it. It's like, if you're just changing nature and the way how our bodies are supposed to metabolize nature, if we're changing that, we're changing ourselves. And, I, you know, I just think that's really scary. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but just the rise of everything and get out there and uh, make change. We're going to do some Q&A, and I want to give you some tools first. Um, NongMOShoppingGuide.com, tool number one. There's over 4,000 products that are third-party verified as non-GMO. If you have an iPhone or iPad, you can download Shop No GMO. It also has them. We have a shopping guide in a packet form, in a pocketbook form, at the table, although that has the brands only. And the brands, sometimes they have GMO and sometimes they have non-GMO in their products. So the electronic version lists all the products. The pocket version lists the brands, and you have to check to see if it's labeled non-GMO when you get to the aisle of the grocery store. There's also a list of at-risk ingredients which you can avoid by looking at, you know, if it says maltodextrin, it's probably from corn. Um, another tool is we have books, and again, we'd like to do a lending library because I know when I was a student, we didn't buy books unless they were assigned, and we'd like to have a lending library. We, the most recent movie we have created is called Genetic Roulette, The Gamble of Our Lives, and we released it for free online for one week. How many people have seen it? Okay, so we know that it really changes people's attitudes and diet on the spot. 
We had 1.25 million views that week. And here's a late breaker. Tomorrow, it'll go up for another free week. Good. No one knows that yet. And to find it, you go to geneticroulettemovie.com. Another tool is our website, responsibletechnology.org. And responsibletechnology.org, you can you pull the um, our literature and our brochures, they have our websites on them. And please take one for free. We have a brochures and shopping guide. And sign up for our newsletter, which is called Spilling the Beans. And you can get that. It comes out semi whenever whenever we get a chance. But we have also now a non-GMO click and send revolutionary army working with us on social media. And every day for the past week, we've sent out a video uh, related to GMOs, Prop 37, GMO education. Today we sent out a video with Danny DeVito and Bill Maher and about 10 other celebrities. It's, it's going viral today. It came out this morning. I suggest that you uh, Google it and see what it has to say. You can join that click and send non-GMO revolutionary army at responsibletechnology.org and there's a Facebook page there as well. So that's some of the materials, the Prop 37 people have materials back there, but visit us at the table, and now I'll be happy to take your questions. Yes. Uh, one, thank you so much for your tireless effort and educating people around It's not entirely tireless. <laughs> I remember on Friday last week, I figured out, okay, I had did 16 press interviews, including Dr. Oz, and packed and unpacked 12 times and gave talks to seven groups. And I it wasn't entirely tireless. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Oz will air in a week or two, yeah? So um, I've done organic for decades, and my household's like 98.9% .9 organic, but I also like dining out. And there's a few restaurants in Boulder, not Boulder, I'm here in Santa Barbara, that, um, you know our organic and such, but um, the day that I went and saw your film, I rarely do Mexican food, but I went and had Mexican food and had a tamale and all that. And once I saw your film, I was like, oh God, I just wanted to like get it out of my body. And so um, what do you suggest with, I mean, the restaurant, you know? Well, first of all, I have to say in terms of getting it out of your body, I did not mention something. Uh, the only human feeding study ever published showed that GM genes can transfer from soybeans, take up residence in the DNA of the bacteria living inside your intestines, and may continue to function there, producing GM proteins. If that happens with the Bt toxin, it might turn our intestinal flora into living pesticide factories. I think it does happen with the Bt toxin. I think that's why 93% of pregnant women and 80% of unborn fetuses have Bt toxin in their blood because they needed a constant source of production because it's washed out regularly. The authors thought it may be the GM feed fed to the animals, and so it was the milk and meat of the animals that caused the high percentage, but I think it was the colonization of gut bacteria. And so a common question is, how do we get rid of that? I don't know, but I can say that people are getting better when they switch to non-GMO diets. So I wanted to respond to the getting it out thing first. Um, when I go out to eat, I don't go to fast food places because they make processed foods that come from soy, corn, cottonseed, and canola, the, five, the nine genetically modified food crops. Soy, and it's listed in the, in the pamphlet, you don't have to write it down. Soy, corn, cottonseed oil, canola oil, sugar from sugar beets, alfalfa used as hay, papaya from Hawaii or China, and some zucchini and crookneck squash. As far as we know, no popcorn has been genetically engineered and commercialized at this point. But if you look at processed foods, It'll contain derivatives of soy and corn and sugar and cottonseed and canola oil in large quantities. So if it's boxed in a package, chances are it's got genetically modified ingredients. Not all of them, but the vast majority. So when you go out to eat, you've got to go to places that cook from scratch. And if they cook from scratch, most of the GMOs would be visible. You can risk it on zucchini or crack neck squash if you feel lucky, but it may have polenta or corn on the cob or or corn chips, like 
or palmetto or chili vinos. And those would be obviously from corn products. And then you can have tofu or soy sauce, and those could obviously be from soy, products, soy products. But the invisible ones are primarily the oils, soy, corn, cotton, and canola oils. So I go to restaurants, after, usually after I phone them, and I say, as I've said a thousand times, what oil do you cook with? Or I might say, if I have time, I don't eat genetically engineered foods, which includes soybean, corn, cotton, and canola, which is found in the oils. What kind of oil do you use? And some people say vegetable oil, it's not soy or corn. They don't realize vegetable oil is soy. It's from vegetables. Um, no, it's from soy. So they'll, if, if they use olive oil, I often say, do you use pure olive oil or a blend? Because some blend it with canola. If they use something other than soy, corn, cotton, or canola, it's very easy. If they use soy, corn, cotton, or canola, I have to say, can you cook mine in olive oil or butter or something other than that? And if they can, I don't go there. So Mexican, Chinese, Japanese, sometimes Indian, are often very hard. Italian, Greek, Mediterranean, often very easy. Olive oil. And um, so then there's the salad dressing, which is also often soybean or canola. So that's the steps I take when I go out to eat. So Stanford study received a lot of press, and as soon as organic was promoted very, very highly by consumer's choice, there were organizations representing conventional food that started to create studies to disinform. And their selection of studies and criteria is often skewed to drive a certain conclusion. Now, Roundup is used as a drying agent for conventionally grown lentils, barley, oats, wheat, a lot of grains. And so it's, Roundup is very dangerous at very, very low levels, and it's in there. And they don't look at that in that study. They don't look at the toxic effects of pesticides, herbicides, or fungicides, and their choice of parameters was very small and, and designed in a poor way. So I would say, I'm not an expert at organic, but I know someone who is. His name is Charles Benbrook, and if you go to the Organic Center, he did a very comprehensive evaluation of the Stanford study, basically showing that it was not to be trusted, and we've also learned that the statistician used to be a shill for the uh, tobacco industry, trying to say why tobacco was safe. So it doesn't surprise me. But I'm not an expert, but I did read his evaluation. Okay, now you've got to sprint all the way over here. We're going to give you a chance. Go ahead. You can start. The seal is valid. The seal is the USD, the, the organic standard. It's, there's, it used to be that organic was created by industry, and in most countries it was a government, you know, supported thing. So they just got together and, and made it a government supported program. But it's still the organic standard. Now the USDA is a disaster related to GMOs. In July 1st, 2011, they told Scott's Miracle Grow, we don't have to look at your Roundup Ready Kentucky Bluegrass. It, it doesn't fit into our criteria, so you can introduce it without telling anyone in the government or anyone of consumers. And this was opening the door to thousands of GMOs that didn't have to be looked at, knowing that it would be sprayed with Roundup and kids would be rolling in it. They just ignored it. So they're a disaster, and they're run by the former Baltic Governor of the Year, Tom Vilsack. Next. Straight back. Let's get Actually, before we go on to the next question, there's one person that I forgot to thank who helped me out a lot with this event and four more people head out. He's sitting over there in the corner, Mr. Tom Lehman. Stand up. I'm a little crazy when it comes to planning, I'm a little forgetful, so he was an essential factor towards that forgetfulness. So I appreciate all his help. And then I got a request for you to talk about burn down. 
Yes, I did actually. Well, it'll burn down. I did talk about dry down. Uh, by the way, um, we are going to leave soon after this because this is the first of two events I'm speaking at today. I've already had, I think, three press interviews. Um, my voice is hurting, actually. Um, so if you, you can, do we, are we going to have stuff here for people to buy after I leave? No. So if you want to get any books or DVDs, and I know that in uh, colleges, the money's tight, but if you want to get that, you don't have to wait till the end of the Q&A because at that point, we're going to rush into the car and arrive late. So if you wanted to get something, you could do that now while Rachel is packing up. Burn down is something that's used by farmers when they want to eliminate the seeds and, and uh, of weeds and stuff in a field. They'll just spray Roundup all over the, uh, the field before the season or the end of the season. And so Roundup ends up in the soil. And sometimes that alone will promote the soil pathogens. And the next year you'll find things like sudden death syndrome for soy or gosses, wilt, and corn just in the area where the Roundup was sprayed. Or if they're spraying Roundup with a tractor and they go around a bend and hit it twice, you can look from aerial views where it was hit twice and that's where you end up with plant diseases because that's what Roundup does, it promotes plant diseases. The Roundup is extremely powerful antibiotic. When we eat it, it can kill gut bacteria that's beneficial, but not the E. coli or the botulism or the salmonella. And so now there's an actual epidemic of botulism in cows, and now they have a new technology to evaluate the presence of botulism at low levels in humans, and they find that sudden infant death syndrome appears to be from botulism, and that may be promoted by the presence of Roundup. So it's, it, it gets, it goes on and on and on. Yes? Well, Henry David Thoreau had a famous quote that for every uh, thousand men hacking at the branches of evil, only one digs at the root. So it seems the problem is, unless we have some kind of spiritual basis to our movement, there's just going to be a bunch of more devils come up. And the devil's been let loose out there in the world. And Gandhi, he always listened to his inner voice and he felt that he was following God. So we need a spiritual movement because I think spiritual science is much more powerful than physical science, the science of the spirit and the mind. And this physical science doesn't seem to be good. We wouldn't need all the great studies and things that you quote if we had. We need this movement going for millions of people each donating money and, and gathering together and, and working together. And I don't know how we're going to get there, but we definitely need a, a spiritual backing from a higher power. And that is not an easy thing to do. Thank you that, for that, and thank you for your passion. That's beautiful. And I want to say also, we're going to be releasing um, some videos of spiritual leaders that we videotaped in a studio. It sounds like a joke, but a Hindu, a rabbi, a swami, a rabbi, a pastor, and two reverends walked into a video studio. And you'll see the results next week. Um, yeah, actually, let's get someone over here because I want to try and get the full range before we run out of here in three and a half minutes. So try to make your questions short because there's five other hands that went up and I'm not sure we'll get to them all. Uh, uh, is there anything you can do after Roundup has been sprayed on the soil to reverse or shorten the length of the soil's toxicity or plants you can use to more or something like that? It's being studied. There's some evaluations going on but nothing conclusive. Um, the biological activity does not appear to eat it up. Um, that's what I thought. I was just with Don Huber, who's an expert at Roundup. We spoke together at the Conscious Life Expo for a couple of days. He's an expert at remediation. He's done huge acreage, million acre plots for, in China. He's worked in Mongolia, and he's one of the world's experts. And nothing yet is set, but they're looking at it. All right, more questions? Yes, right here. Getting my work out for the day. Um, why are the farmers who grow organic food and how can we make sure that they grow it in equitable terms for them? Wait, what was it about the organic food? Um, how close are you now? Who are the farmers who grow organic food and how can we make sure that we get it in equitable ways from these farmers? Like, so the farmers, farmers that grow organic will label their products organic. And it's easy to find when you go shopping. 
And if they go to the expense and effort to grow organic, they're going to go to the expense and effort to brag about it. And by buying organic, you not only support better health, but also an entire farming system. So it's really an investment. And the, a lot of, like on my film, you'll see parents of autistic kids saying when their kids were put on non-GMO, they got better behaviorally and gastrointestinally. They got them off of GMOs by switching to organic. So it's not only non-GMO, but you also don't have the Roundup, you also don't have the, the other synthetic chemicals. So it's a very big investment also in your health and the next generation. Okay, let's see how many hands we have. Okay, one, two, three, four. We're not gonna get to everyone, go ahead. I just have something to put out there for everyone. Um, Shepherd Farms does all organic growth and um, they have CSA boxes which we send out to Santa Barbara. So if you guys are interested in getting weekly amounts of organic produce for a really good deal, look up Shepherd Farms and we can hook you guys up. So what I'd like you to do is, I would like to see, is there anyone else that has uh, an announcement, a short announcement about events related to this or resources related to this that they'd like to share? Yes, in the back. now for the students. How many students here are interested in doing some kind of GMO education on campus? Raise your hand. All right, so um, tell me again your name. Ashley. Ashley, I thought so. Ashley's going to be meeting right here. She doesn't know this yet, but now she does. She's going to be meeting right here with all of you who want to do the education. And then you can form a tipping point network, a, a, a tipping point network group. And that's what, the, not the, that's what we have around the country is thousands of people through the Tipping Point Network. We also do speaker trainings and things like that. And you can even start with your local on-campus uh, food services as one kind of test case. You can do education through colleges. You can become speakers. You can show films. And also, I recommend Thinking Huge. I want to make a t-shirt that says, Think Huge. Thinking big is so last century. Because we have huge problems and we need huge thinkers to, to solve those problems. And so when you think huge as a college student, think in terms of all the colleges in the area, think in terms of all the UC college systems, think in terms of setting a template so that every college student can do something. Because it just takes a package that can be spread and you know that college students are networked. So you just put the right thing into that network that, that, that reverberates, that captures the attention and imagination and action of the students. And from here, you can do it all. Now, I have to leave now, but I want to say that there is an incredible opportunity now for education between now and the election, because they're pouring it on. The disinformation campaign is huge, so everyone's talking about Prop 37. So if you've ever wanted to get someone's attention on GMOs, Anywhere in the world, this is a place that's saturated with what's that all about? So the receptor cells are open. The leverage point is here, and the world changing event is on November 6th, and actually, people start voting today by mail. So, we'd like to get involved in this education effort. Thank you, Ed, very much. Thank you.